I'm William San Martin. I'm an assistant teaching professor in the Humanities and Arts Department at Worcester Polytechnic Institute in the United States. I would like to thank uh, Ariel, Christoph, and the RCC staff uh, for the chance to be here in residence in Munich today. Uh, during these few weeks, it's been inspiring, not only at the scholarly level, but also in terms of revisiting my own questions about how institutions build intellectual communities across disciplines and national borders especially in times when this task seems more pressing than ever and when we are pushed as scholars and citizens to rethink our current models and frameworks. I'm a historian and STS scholar. I like thinking about time scales and how knowledge, society and technology interact across time and space. I started my career studying how slaves and African descendants use the judicial system, acquire legal knowledge and build social networks within the bureaucracy and racial hierarchies of the Spanish Empire. I asked questions about the social life of power and knowledge. I learned how slaves and their families contested and negotiated their legal and social status. I paid attention to hybrid, mobile, permeable communities and categories. Uh, you also learn how racial categories like blackness and legal classifications like slavery were much more fluid categories than portrayed in official imperial centers. More importantly, they were co-produced and the intersection of the social practices of those in power and those considered subaltern. Ultimately, I learned that inequalities are shaped, contested, and institutionalized in the daily life of social interactions. Looking at those spaces of encounter and contestation is critical to address long-lasting issues of marginalization, power disparities, and violence. Later on, I started scientific exchange programs on science diplomacy and endeavors for agricultural development projects in Latin America during the Cold War. In particular, I look at how American and Chilean scientists and government agencies built an institutional framework for the quick incorporation of new agricultural knowledge and technologies that eventually enabled what we call today the Green Revolution. I also had the honor to work with government officials in the Agricultural Development Institute in Chile, addressing the impacts of free-ranging dogs in biodiversity and the livelihoods of small-scale farmers and indigenous communities. Lately, I have, I have focused my attention uh, on one of the most impactful effects of the Green Revolution, the global increase of anthropogenic reactive nitrogen and its challenges for global governance, which is the main uh, focus of my talk today. Along this process, I become increasingly interest, interested in questions about the epistemological basis of inequality. In public and scholarly debates, I have learned that issues of justice tend to follow the human-non-human -human divide. I've argued that our inability to address injustices across species is embedded in the mechanisms and institutions that shape our knowledge production and determine what knowledge enters the policy arena. I took these initial minutes uh, to share this intellectual journey because I profoundly believe that these social histories, those histories of intellectual encounters and negotiations, are the tools that we have today to unveil the driving forces of our unequal world, and eventually rebuild new ways of knowing and doing as we navigate our future. Today, many agree that ecological change disproportionately impacts communities across class, race, gender, species, and ecosystems. However, the complex mechanisms which, by which these inequalities arise, the multiple agencies and power relationships that enable these disparities and their long-lasting effects across species are still under-theorized and under-historized. My current research on the governance of Nadrian species aims to invite these discussions and provide a window for further conversations on the place of diversity and equity as ontological and epistemological standpoints in how we study and govern socio-environmental conflicts. Let's talk about nitrogen now. 
As we probably remember from high school, nitrogen is an essential requirement for all living organisms. However, it is mostly present on Earth, on Earth in unreactive forms. That means it's chemically unavailable to most living organisms and must be fixed into a reactive form before animals and plants can use it. Through multiple biochemical cycles on Earth, nitrogen is converted into reactive forms as it circulates among atmospheric, terrestrial, and marine ecosystems. Although human nitrogen fixation includes various sources such as fossil fuel combustion and biomass burning, the increasing use of synthetic nitrogen fertilizers during what we call today the Green Revolution has been one of the main drivers increasing nitrogen global, globally since the 1960s. In the early years of the Green Revolution, nitrogen fertilizer use was heavily concentrated in the United States and in Western Europe. As part of expanding new farming practices and technologies, hotspots of fertilizer application grew in Asia and Latin America. Projections show new intensification zones through 2050 in South Asia, Latin America, and North and East Africa. It is important to know that as we call this a process of globalization of agricultural practices and increasing reactive nitrogen rates, this is a process that expanded in uneven ways. As these estimations published in 2010 show, nitrogen fertilization rates and therefore contributions to global emissions have been unevenly distributed worldwide. At the same time, as nitrogen moved from the field of agricultural development projects in the 1960s to become a governable species in the arena of global environmental governance in the 1970s and 80s, Scientific production on the negative impacts of nitrogen has also been unevenly distributed throughout this process. In the late 1970s, as nitrogen became part of, new, of a new infrastructure for global governance under the United Nations Environment Program, researchers raised questions about the imbalances in nitrogen consumption. While some countries apply too much fertilizer, others lack the minimum for local food demand which is also true today. They also pointed out the dependency of developing countries on nitrogen, and significantly for this talk, the lack of precise estimations of nitrogen flows across biochemical cycles. What is important to highlight about this process that connects the history of the Green Revolution with the history of global environmental governance is first Unequal nitrogen use and therefore contributions to planetary emissions have been structural features of this historical process and are expected to continue as new regions aim to increase agricultural production in the future. And second, although the reduction of nitrogen pollution is a critical goal today, the acknowledgement that the functioning of the economic system depends on a stable flow of reactive nitrogen is at the core of potential better management strategies. And I'll stop here for a moment. Today, scientists agree that about 80% of reactive nitrogen used for food production is lost into the environment. That nitrogen enters earth systems. It pollutes watersheds and coastal ecosystems threatening drinking water and causing eutrophication and hypoxia, the excessive growth of algae which results in oxygen depletion and the production of substances toxic to fish, livestock, and humans. Furthermore, nitrogen compounds threaten air quality and contribute to climate change. Nitrous oxide is estimated to have a warming potential around 300 times that of carbon dioxide, which a median lifetime in the atmosphere of 200 years. Furthermore, nitrogen is estimated to be a significant threat to global biodiversity. The nitrogen cascade concept has offered scientists an umbrella term to conceptualize the multiple impacts of nitrogen across time and space. The concept emphasizes that nitrogen lost into the environment circulates across time and space, from local to global scales and from days to centuries in ways that present ecological, disciplinary, and political boundaries. Equally important, the global nitrogen and phosphor cycles are among the critical Earth system processes in the planetary boundaries framework. 
It is fundamental to consider that while the biochemical processes that some of these boundaries represent are at least partially institutionalized in governance systems, for instance, freshwater use and biodiversity, others such as the planetary boundaries of nitrogen and phosphorus are hardly subject to policy. More recently, intergovernmental organizations, including the United Nations Environment, Environment Program, have adopted nitrogen as a critical socio-environmental issue and a fundamental piece in achieving the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Now, although scientific knowledge on the multiple ways nitrogen impacts humans and ecosystems have dramatically expanded, and scientists have been effective in bringing nitrogen to the global governance agenda, both scientific knowledge and policy frameworks have run in a rather unequal way. Today, nitrogen science combines a set of multiple disciplines and bodies of knowledge where expert communities mostly focus on distinct nitrogen forms, for instance, nitrous oxide or ammonia, distinct metrics, nitrogen use efficiency and nitrogen loss, or defects in a specific human or environmental media for instance, soil acidification or eutrophication of coastal ecosystems. This chemical and ontological variability of nitrogen across time and space has created a set of highly specialized expert communities with distinct methods and metrics. While assessing and quantifying certain phases of this biochemical process has been easier for some of these communities, other aspects are still remain unknown. Today, these unequal quantifications of nitrogen flows as an expression of the imbalanced scientific knowledge about the trade-offs between different nitrogen forms and linked biochemical cycles is considered critical for both the further advancements of nitrogen science and the role of nitrogen in the global governance arena. Researchers agree that uneven estimations of global nitrogen flows are due to several reasons. First, biochemical cycles are complex, and studies are only able to address part of the cycle and a specific chemical species. Second, data at a global scale are still scarce, and except from the information gathered by satellite images or global models, data coverage is not homogeneous across the globe. Third, a strong regional differences exist in terms of environmental conditions, climate, and sources of pollution. Fourth, methodological approaches and metrics differ from study to study. These discrepancies among quantifications and methods expose that the nitrogen cascade, although a critical guiding concept, it still represents a purely conceptual framework that can be barely translated into integrated policy instruments. At a national level, major policy instruments addressing nitrogen pollution in Europe and the United States have indeed followed these epistemic and chemical divisions. Policies have mostly addressed a particular nitrogen form and environmental media in which the pollution form occurs, for instance, drinking water or air pollution. At an international level, this challenge becomes even larger. Relevant instruments to address the nitrogen challenge are indeed divided in many regulatory bodies and intergovernmental organizations. The scientific community has widely understood that addressing this is a significant challenge to build a framework for global nitrogen governance. Institutions such as the International Nitrogen Initiative and INMS towards international nitrogen management systems have been critical in acknowledging this challenge. Working on global and regional quantifications of nitrogen use is one of the four key priorities of INMS. Quantifi quantifying flows and trade-offs, benchmarking nitrogen indicators, and sharing standard methodologies across regions are also critical for developing the first global nitrogen assessment, one of the, these institutions' goals. Along this process, uh, researchers and organizations have agreed on the need to establish an international Nitrogen Convention allowing for further coordination between countries and multilateral environmental agreements. What scientists have called an IPCC for nitrogen, but addressing the specific challenges of these chemical species. 
INMS is currently working with the UN to establish the Interconvention Nutrient Coordination Mechanism, INCO, acronym that researchers have prized for highlighting the economic value of better nutrient management. This new institutional infrastructure is expected to provide a new turning point in the history of nutrient governance. However, the discussion about imbalances in nutrient flows has omitted additional questions about the inequality of scientific and policy assessments. Let me offer some few points uh, for the analysis. Research institutions and scientific communities around the world have unequal access to resources, laboratories, and instruments. Representation from developing countries has been limited in international assessments. For instance, contributing authors of our Nutrient World, a report published in 2013 and a leading source for the UN Environment Assembly Resolution adopted in 2019, only integrated around 30% of researchers with institutional affiliations in non-OECD countries. As my research focus on Chile has shown, national science policy interface frameworks relevant for nutrient management are sometimes inexistent. Except from the Indian nutrient assessment, in-depth regional assessments have mostly taken place in the United States, Europe, and OECD members. Although efforts towards increasing representation and coordination of scientific assessments and policy instruments continue, which are crucial to assess the problem of imbalance, quantifications, and threats, there is a profound lack of understanding of how distinct nitrogen forms, farming practices, and scientific communities interact with policy frameworks in many regions around the world. Now, let me offer some final reflections that I hope invite a further conversation on governance, knowledge, and justice. Environmental problems without boundaries have been at the center of Earth systems governance research since it emerged in the late 1970s and 80s. Similarly, the limited global representation in scientific assessments and the policy arena has been a feature of other governance systems, including climate change and the IPCC. In this sense, neither its mobility nor the north-south knowledge divide is specific to the nitrogen problem. However, the chemical, ontological, and epistemic variability of nitrogen across time and space, and its centrality for the functioning of food markets and economies, make nitrogen governance even a more significant challenge for the 21st century. Farming practices as a source of pollution present a distinct set of challenges. First, there are many individual farmers around the world with different farming practices and production processes. Second, farmers are a social group frequently characterized by scientists and policy makers as resistant to change. Social scientists are still a minority among nutrient expert communities. The fact that farmers' decisions and assumptions are the final steps in shaping farming practices seems usually forgotten in academic discussions. Third, while internalizing environmental costs is part of a broader discussion on environmental policy, the global agricultural market is today a productive sector with high uncertainty on how any cost might be transferred to consumers at any scale. Therefore, Nadrigan raises several questions about what governance scholars call the polycentric nature of governance and the barriers to change of non-governance systems. A knowledge systems and knowledge governance. Although an essential part of the Nadrigan problem today Mechanisms that made the Green Revolution such an effective process are still mostly ignored by expert communities. A better understanding of the local, institutional, and social histories that have shaped the variety of nitrogen uses and managements worldwide will be critical in informing future decisions. Organizations such as the International Nutrient Initiative, INMS, and INCOM although instrumental in the arena of global environmental science and policy, will require a better understanding of how to improve the mechanisms by which the production and circulation of nitrogen knowledge occur at local and regional scales. 
I argue that the scholarship on the socio-political dimensions of natural management and those spaces of encounter and negotiation is critical to effectively advance the transformations of food and governance systems. For instance, the, pro the protests that arose in the Netherlands during October 2018 are probably the first massive responses against policies aimed at reducing nitrogen emissions. This shows that the sources and quantifications of emissions are not only negotiated within the scientific and policy-making communities. Dutch farmers pointed out that nitrogen governance is a social struggle in addition to a science and policy one. During the Green Revolution, institutional frameworks connecting experts and farmers were effective in providing local and transnational channels for the drastic, drastic change in agricultural practices in many areas around the world. Today, however, scholars agree that the lack of institutional partnerships and local extension programs is a significant challenge to expanding better nitrogen management practices. In-depth analysis of relevant agricultural extension programs across regions are still needed in nitrogen scholarship. Questions about local and indigenous knowledge and their interaction with expert communities and political bodies are essential for advancing any effective change. Finally, on power, agency, and justice. A focus on the power disparities across chemical species and knowledge production systems might help us highlight areas that tend to be overlooked in environmental governance research, such as political economy, inequalities, and colonialism. In doing so, I believe Nadrian serves to invite a broad, broader dialogue about the role of epistemological and ontological diversity and disparities in the governance of global environmental injustices. Lastly, with the effects of vector borne diseases, increasing health inequalities, the rise of social movements fighting for social and racial equity, and then even socio-physical and intellectual realities of the Anthropocene, it has become essential to incorporate questions about multi-species justice and agency in social environmental research. Nadrian governance provide a critical opportunity to integrate non-humans, chemical forms, technologies, animals, and ecosystems, and underrepresented agents, small-scale farmers, indigenous peoples and knowledge, and future generations, into a broader understanding of agency and power relations in global environmental issues, especially in the so-called global south. Thank you.